exalt your name today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that we can gather together. And it is in this atmosphere where we can not only exalt and magnify his name, but we can also bring our prayer request to him. And if you can go ahead and put up the slide, in addition to what's represented up on the board in just a moment, I do know that we have a few very specific needs that I wanted to make mention in our church family today. Um, Some of you probably have heard, but on Friday night, unfortunately, Cindy Walsh's mother and her sister and her niece were in a very serious car accident. Her sister has multiple broken bones, but will be okay. Her niece will be okay. Uh, Unfortunately, her mother at this point is on life support, and they are not expecting her to last much longer. Cindy is with us here this morning. She wanted to come to church, but that family needs peace. And they need incredible comfort and wisdom during this time. And we want to pray that God would provide that for them, that his presence would be with them during this very difficult time of transition. In addition to that, last Sunday we had prayer for Sister Maria as she was getting ready to go into surgery. That happened this week. The surgery went as expected, but she is in recovery and there's some additional prognosis. And so she's going to need some more medical attention and help, and we want to pray that God would continue to bring a healing and strength to her body. And then I've also given a few other requests. Brian Maddox, this is Sister Sylvia's husband. He is in the hospital with a heart arrhythmia problem, and it looks like it has been corrected at this point, but they're keeping him for probably at least another day, and we want to pray that God would heal Brian. Bryce Carter, this is Carrie's baby boy, so he is sick this morning, so we want to pray for Bryce Carter. In addition, Richard Carter Sr., so this is Rick Carter's father, is also in need of a touch, and we were asked to pray for him. And George Wagner, who is a longtime church member here, he is not doing well, and the request was that we pray for him as well. I know I've just mentioned several needs, some of them very serious, but we serve a God who is able and who can meet our needs. In addition to that, we have multiple needs also represented up on the board. Would you take a moment with me? Does anybody else have a need, anything they need prayer for? Look around. We always have needs at different times and different stages, but God is faithful and able to meet them. And would you just agree together with me in prayer that God would move on behalf of all these needs? Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, we bring a sacrifice of praise, but now we also bring our petitions to you. And we know that you are faithful and able to meet them. And we have some incredible needs of healing that we're bringing before you this morning. And so I pray that you would bring strength from small children all the way up into our elders. I pray that you would bring a healing in hospital situations. We pray for Cindy's family, that you continue to provide comfort for them, that your peace that passes understanding is with them, that they feel your presence in that hospital room. You give them wisdom and guidance throughout this situation in the next few days. We pray, Lord Jesus, for all the other needs that are here, unspoken needs, needs represented by the lifting of hands, whether it's for protection or provision, whether it's for a healing or for guidance, whatever the situation may be, we know Heavenly Father, that you are able and you can and will meet our needs. And so we bring them to you. We release them to you in faith this morning. Move on our behalf. Be with us today. Help us to be in tune with your presence and your spirit and what it is that you would have for us in this service. And we pray all these things and we put our trust in that wonderful, precious name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Hallelujah. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Lord. We thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. We are delighted that you are here with us this morning. And before we move forward with the next part of our worship service, why don't you take a moment, move out of your place, greet a few people. And welcome them into the house of God today.
signs of healthy church fellowship going on, huh? That's all right. I'm glad to see it. But as you begin to make your way back to your seats, I do have a few announcements, a few things to share. As you made your way around here, you may see some faces you don't recognize. That's all right. You get a chance to greet with them some more. And I'll just keep talking right over all of you until you find your way back to your seats. You will get more chance to do this and an opportunity for further fellowship because this Sunday, I'm happy to announce, we are doing something new here. It's the fifth Sunday of the month, so we're doing this for the first time after service this morning. Do not rush off. We want you to stick around. Across the parking lot in our fellowship hall, we are going to have lunch. We've had different families bring food, and we're kind of potlucking it together, and we're going to share a meal. And so please do not rush after church. In fact, everything you were just doing that I had to talk over you, you can continue to do that all into the afternoon if you so choose. But please join us over in the fellowship hall. If you are a first-time guest here today, normally we have in our reception room on your way out, it would be to your right, a place where we'd like to greet you and have a chance to introduce ourselves, some members of the pastoral team. Today, however, we're doing it a little bit different because we are having a luncheon. And if you are able to stay or even just stop by for a moment, I would highly, highly encourage you to stick around. You can join us for lunch. If you can't, you can at least allow us to shake your hand and introduce ourselves. And so for our church family and our guests, whosoever will after service today, if you could make your way across the parking lot over into our fellowship hall, we're going to have a time of food and fellowship. Part of the purpose of that is to welcome the Faubert family. And they have been here for two weeks now. They are new members of our pastoral team, and they're going to be doing multiple different things in the church. And we want to make sure everyone has a chance to greet them. So be sure to constantly bombard them, go shake their hand, tell them your names again. Not only is he the national quiz coordinator, at the end of the luncheon, we're going to have him stand up and start pointing around the room and naming everybody by their first name. It'll be his first quiz here, so it's going to be great. You don't want to miss it. And he can thank me for that later. In addition to our meeting, um, our afternoon luncheon. You may notice that out in the hallway, she gave me a couple copies of it. It's posted on the bulletin board. You will see some sign-up sheets on October 27th. That's a Saturday at the end of the month at 10 a.m. We have our serving in the church orientation. Several months ago, we did a few lessons about first fruits, one of them being about offering our talents and abilities to God as our first fruit. And we did some little booklets and ways that people could help around the church. So there are some sign-up sheets posted on the bulletin board. If you filled out one of those little booklets, we would like you to be there that Sunday morning. The purpose of this sign-up sheet is we are providing lunch and we need to know how many people are coming. So if you would please just put your name on that sign-up sheet. And then in addition to that, depending on what you volunteered to do, you will also see this notice. Some of you will be here into the afternoon. Some of you, it'll just be the morning orientation and then lunch and you're free to go afterwards. You can see more information posted on the bulletin. I think I have done my due diligence, Sister Lil, wherever she is. I hope that just about covers it. So having said that, if you would stand with me as the ushers make their way back up front. We are now going to continue in our worship and our praise through an act of giving. How many of you recognize it is an act of worship? It is an act of praise when we bring our tithes, when we bring our offerings, when we bring some of our provision back to God. He has gifted us with so much, and we gift it back to him. And Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, we pray that you would take these efforts and that you would multiply them and that you would help it to be fruitful. Let it be used for the work and the glory and the advancement of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy. Sing. 
and the high calling that we have in you. Yes, Heavenly Father. Jesus, you are so good to us today. And we thank you and we praise you for it, Lord.
are so good to us. Help us to turn our attention to you and keep our eyes focused on you today. Yes, Jesus.
Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. I am so thankful for the power of Almighty God, the confidence that I can have in Him. 
the trust I can have in him, the faith I can have in him. I'm totally undone. I don't have the ability to get it together. But Jesus Christ, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His word is established in heaven forever. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. You may be seated. I got a bit of a ring if you can pull down my monitors. I'm kind of a loud mouth. I'll hear myself, I promise. Welcome to all of you. I'm so glad that you're here in the house of God. We're very excited about lunch this afternoon, being able to officially uh, spend some time with the Fulbert's and welcome them into our family. And so I, I second Desi's uh, invitation that you would join us and that you'd be with us. And uh, even if other plans preclude you from this, at least stop by and uh, spend just a few moments before heading out. We will not be offended. We understand that there may be other things precluding you from staying long. But please come and be a part of it. And I'm looking forward to spending time with you. Uh, in lieu of that, uh, there will not be servantship service tonight. So leaders, there will not be a servantship service tonight. So make note of that, all right? I'd like to begin this morning before telling you what I'm doing. I do this all the time with my wife. It irritates her. I'll start in on something and she has no clue what I'm doing, where I'm going, or what I'm talking about. And so I beg your indulgence this morning that you would allow me to do so. And so I'm going to begin by looking at Luke chapter number 12 and beginning with verse number 13. I'm going to read a fairly lengthy passage of scripture here. The scriptures, Luke in particular, records for us that someone called to the crowd Jesus has been teaching and calls from the crowd and says, Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Jesus replies, Friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? And he took this just brief interaction as his entree into a very pivotal passage of Scripture. In fact, this passage we're reading here sits in the same position and has many of the same surrounding verses as the end of the Sermon on the Plain in Matthew. So he says, Beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. And then he told them a story. He said a rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. And the rich man says to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. This question, this statement on the part of the rich man has an assumption buried within it. Namely, I have to preserve these crops. I have to store these crops. I have a farm that is fertile. It is producing fine crops and I need to get my arms around it. I need to contain it. I need to manage it. And so what should I do? Because I'm running out of room. Jesus proceeds on and says that the rich man then said, I know. I'll tear down my current barns and I'll build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to, and here's the operative word, store all my wheat and other goods. I will have the ability to pull it within my control and to store it. I will have the space to be able to preserve it and to keep it. But Jesus goes on. And he says that the rich man then tells us something of his attitude. He says, I'll sit back, having stored up in my barns, having saved, having preserved my riches, I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough. You've stored away for years to come. Now, take it easy. Eat. Drink. Drink. And be merry. But God said to the man, You fool, 
you will die this very night. Then, who will get everything you worked for? Now, if you stopped reading in the text, you might be at a little bit of a loss of what to do with this. You might be at a little bit of a loss of knowing what Jesus told this story for. What was his purpose? What was its meaning? But thankfully, Jesus does not stop. He says very pointedly, yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. I do want it noted that Jesus does not say that a person is a fool who has wealth. No, it is the person who due to the wealth does not have a rich relationship with God. But even that's a little hard to define. What exactly does that mean, Jesus? So then Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, this is why I tell you. And he must have told them before. It seems to be implied within the text that this is something he's been telling them. This is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food to eat or enough clothes to wear. For life is more than food and your body is more than clothing. Look at the ravens. They don't plant. They don't harvest. And here Jesus draws us right back to his story, lest you think he's left it. They don't store food in barns, for God feeds them. And you, Jesus says, you are far more valuable to him than any birds. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And if worry can't accomplish a little thing like that. Just adding one moment, just pushing out your appointment with death by one moment. If your worry can't do anything like that, that little thing, what's the use of worrying over bigger things? Look at the lilies, how they grow. They don't work. They don't make their clothing Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. This is, by the way, paralleled, as I've already alluded to, in Matthew at the end of the Sermon on the Plain. And if God cares so wonderfully for the flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith. He goes on, he says, don't be concerned about what to eat and what to drink. Don't worry about such things. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world, but your father already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom We typically read this from Matthew, but here it is again, the same statement. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and he will give you, he will give you everything you need. So don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to those in need. This will store up treasure for you in heaven. And the purses of heaven never get old or develop holes. And your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it and no moth can destroy it. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. And now he's returned back to, if you have wealth, but are not in a rich relationship with God, you are a fool. Now, lest we miss this point in Matthew, he gives one additional point. He tells the disciples, no one can serve two masters. For you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God, And he's got a lot of choices, what he puts on the opposite side of God. He could have talked about fornication. 
He could have talked about all kinds of expressions that are in opposition to God. But his answer was mammon, wealth. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. The scriptures teach us that you can hold money and not serve it. Job is a great example of this. Described as the wealthiest man of his time. And due to the testing of the devil, he loses it all. And we have that great phrase that he says, The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This tells me that God must have known about Job. That he held that wealth lightly. That he held that wealth in a manner that he could let it go just as easily as he had received it. His hand was not closed. He was not like our rich farmer who encircled his arms around his wealth and said, I must store and I must control and I must take precedence and and management over this. It came and Job used it. It went and Job let it go. But the reality is is that all of us, every single one of us, because of sin, because of brokenness, even after the Holy Ghost, even after baptism in Jesus' name, even after repentance that precedes that baptism, we all are an idolatrous people. Every one of us, because of the broken nature within us, we seek to worship that which we can see, that which we can touch, and yes, that which we can control. We struggle with this. Every single person within the sound of my voice struggles with this. And please hear me this morning under the unction and anointing of God. If you are answering in your mind right now, I used to, but I don't anymore. It's got you. Idolatry will never be exterminated from the heart of man until death has exterminated its source, and that is sin. Every one of us is broken. Every one of us seeks to find a way not to engage with the dangerous God who cannot be seen, the dangerous God who does things that do not make sense, the dangerous God who invites us and compels us to walk in faith, not in sight. And every one of us wants to find a way not to do that. It's uncomfortable. It's scary. And frankly, the biggest problem I would contend is, is we're completely out of control. We can't wrap our arms around that God. We cannot store that God. We cannot control that God. Inside of that power, inside of that unlimitedness is the source of our salvation. That's why sin cannot conquer God. That's why God will always win when you give him your life. But you will not control him. You will not be able to tell him what to do. You will not be able to do anything but walk in faith. In fact, he said, without faith, you can't please me. You must believe that I am. And you must believe that I reward those who diligently seek me. Throughout scripture, before any revival, before any correction of a father who delights in his son or his daughter, before any movement back to God, a people have to repent. They have to name their sin. They have to call it out. There's something about the verbal expression and the acknowledgement of the reality of it. And they have to turn from it. They have to not only ask God to forgive them, but they have to ask God to change them. This morning, I need to preach to you a sermon of repentance. This sermon is very much about me is very much for me. But I also believe in the Spirit that there are others of you who you've been straining in life 
You've been calling to God, asking him for revival, for the salvation of your family, for the transformation of your communities, for the visions that have been cast here from the opening day of this church to come to pass. And like the rich young ruler who came to Jesus, Jesus says one thing thou lackest. I don't want to be overly dramatic here today. But this is our peace. This is our peace. The sermon of repentance is my repentance. For to date, I have failed you. I didn't intend to, but I still have. And if God is going to take us where he needs to take us, this idolatry has to be destroyed. We have to tear down what is within us. Constantly, vigilantly tear it down. In February of this year, I sat in a preacher's conference and I listened to the voice of God. But now as I look back, I realize I was attempting, as we all do from time to time, to serve two masters. And I heard the voice of the Almighty say to me, spend the money. I was struck with terror, with fear. From the age of 16, I have done everything that God ever told me to do. I've never not done what he told me to do. Please understand, I've sinned, I've failed. But in those moments when he would step into that sin situation, when he would step into that brokenness, whether through the voice of an elder or directly from his voice, and tell me what to do, I would do it. So there was no question in my mind that I would do this. I would do what he instructed me to do, but it terrified me. Since then, I've been obedient, but I have been fearful. I have continued to try to manage our wealth, our fortune as a people. I've continued to try to hold on to the control of what was happening. Again and again, I hear his voice in the succeeding months. When will my presence be enough I am with you spend the money but you see wealth wants to be master Jesus did not pick other things He said, when you have a choice to make between obeying the commandment to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy mind, thy soul, and thy strength, the opposing force is not the devil. The opposing force is wealth. It is that which provides for you control. It is that which provides for you security. It is that which provides for you the ability to operate, and to live without me. Many of you know this story. Forgive me if it's a little bit redundant for those that don't. In the fall of 1978, specifically the first Sunday in December, my father and my mother began to hold services in a Weight Watchers building on Main Street. Subsequent to that, they then moved a little further outside of town to the George Wilson Community Center. And then they purchased 
this piece of property. After quickly renovating the house, we began to worship in that house. And in the year 1981, at the end of 1981, there were 30 people. They had cash in hand of $23,364.70. They had debt of approximately 43000 The property was worth 55000 We put 10000 down, and it had been about a year, so we are assuming we had paid down a couple of thousand dollars then. At the end of 1981, God spoke. I do not have the specifics of when and where, but I do know that he spoke to my father. And he told my father, you need to build. The cost of that first portion of that metal building that we will have fellowship in here today was $30,000. My mother was adamantly opposed and was fearful With good reason. They owed more than they had. And he was telling them to spend more than they had. I want everybody to see that right there. They owed more than they had. And he was telling them to spend more than they had. Just as a sideline that will be important a little bit later. Missions giving for that year was a grand total of $1,855.20, approximately $150 a month. I was about 10. I don't know if I remember it from the conversation subsequent as this story has been told, but my memory tells me that I remember, I seem to remember my father and my mother sitting at 117 Aronimic Drive in our living room there, and my mom with a strength that few of you have seen, but occasionally when you have, it's freaked you out. Getting in my father's face, not literally, but figuratively, telling him, Jim, this is the wrong move. She wasn't wrong. From the book's perspective, it was the wrong move. Keep saving money. Keep paying off the debt. Get debt free. But God had spoke. And when God speaks, our rules go out the window. They have to. Or he's not God. Anything that stops his direction becomes preeminent over him. Now the problem is, is these numbers look small. We're approximately just shy of 40 years later, and they look small. So I want to help you understand the reality of this faith move. Because my father looked at my mother and says, Eleanor, you can talk to me all you want to in this house. You can tell me your opinion, and I'll listen to it, and I'll think about it, and I'll pray about it. But when we hit that business meeting, don't you dare open your mouth or we're going to have trouble. Why would my father speak that way to my mother? My father loves my mother. My father has given his life to my mother. Why would he speak that way? Because when the voice of God speaks, it trumps all other relationships. Nothing else is allowed to stand if he's truly God. My mother, as I remember, it did not speak. And they built that building. And before they finished building that building, before they ever took occupancy of that building, the congregation had doubled from 30 to 60, swelled out the house. And within three years, they'd paid the property off. But when God spoke it, When God directed it, there was no indication that that is what was going to happen. In fact, we had decreased in size at the George Wilson Community Center. We were on a downturn 
not an upturn. At the beginning of this year, the end of 2017, we had $498,529.43 in the bank, cash in hand. Now, for those of you that math is hard, I'm going to slow down just a little bit because I'm not real good at it either. In order to talk about what debt would be, to talk about what anything God's directing us to do would be, we need to, we need to have a multiplier. We need to understand what equals $498,529.43. And the way that you do that is you divide the 498 and change with the 23,000. And that's a multiplier of 21.34. Cash in hand, cash in hand. I'm not getting complicated to talk about the buying power. That's beyond the point of this. So when you use that multiplier, that means that in order for us to be in the same place, taking the same type of step of faith that my father took in 1981, we would need, in addition to our 498000 in change in cash in hand, we would need to have a debt of nearly a million dollars. $917,620.50. And we would need to be being instructed by God to be spending $640,000, 200. In other words, we'd have less than what we owed and we'd be being asked to spend more than we had. That's the parallel. That's what my father did. On one thing alone, the voice of the Almighty. There was no board behind him. There was no instructions coming from district or national officials. There was nothing but the voice of the Almighty God. You have half a million dollars, you're a million dollars in debt, spend over a half a million. Is everybody with me? I know the numbers don't look like that. It looks like just 23,000 and 43,000, 30,000. It looks kind of small and, and, and we can kind of wrap our brains around it. No, no, no. Let's put it in, in this reality. If God stepped to me and said, you have half a million dollars, you're a million dollars in debt, and I want you to spend over what you have. That's the step he took in 1981. Makes my mom look smart, doesn't it? Makes my dad look stupid, doesn't it? Now the problem with the next number, and this is integral to the story, is that at the end of 2017, we had given into world missions $125,039.86. And those of you that are quick with numbers, you already know, the multiplier doesn't match. 21 Point three four would mean we were given thirty six thousand dollars, roughly, a year. Three thousand dollars a month, as opposed to the seventy five or seventy six hundred dollars a month, just on global missions, let alone all the other offerings, because the multiplier is sixty seven point four. It is over triple the multiplier of the resources we have. That's part of the picture. That's part of the story. That's part of what you got to get a hold of. But it's also part of the idolatry. Now, what are we really looking at? All right, so let's go to 1982, just as I'm going to go to 2018. 2018, as you already know, we began the year with $498,529.43. Point 
but we have no debt. Zero dollars of debt. And what God has instructed me to do this year, as best as I can estimate it, is to spend less than or equal to approximately $75,000. Not $620,000. $75,000. And I'm terrified. I'm flipping out. Why? I'll tell you that in a minute. Because with every call to repentance, always comes a word from the Lord. Missions is going to be greater than or equal to 100,000. So why am I flipping out? Why am I losing it? What's going on here? That's the faith statement that my father made. And all I'm being asked to do is that. Less than what I have in my stewardship. And what we have is greater than what we owe. Just so you don't miss it. He had more debt than what he had. And he's being asked to spend more than what he had. I have no debt. We have no debt. I'm not even talking about, by the way, the property value that we now have of $1.3 to $1.5 million. I'm not even putting that into the picture. And I promise you, when we bought the property, it was $55,000 and we owed on it. So what did we have in equity? Maybe $12,000. I'm not even putting the 1.3 to 1.5 in. Why am I flipping out? So God's been saying to me, month after month, every time the... Stewards of receipts, I get a notification that the bank deposit's gone in. I rush to the books to look at what this week's deposit was. God, when are you going to stop asking me to walk in faith? When are you going to stop asking me? Come on, God, I've done it. June, July. August, every week from Australia, I check the books every single week. I check the bank statements every single week. Why? Why would I be fearful? Particularly when you hear his voice saying over and over again, I'm with you. I'm with you. Because wealth always wants to rule. And so, Thursday night, as I stood in the bleachers at the General Conference of the United Pentecostal Church, God began to reveal to me. Fear is masquerading as frugality. Now, this is where it's going to start hitting home. Because this isn't just me. Because this is a spiritual thing. And as I lead, I impact you. As I lead, you feel the spiritual impact of this. Fear is masquerading as frugality. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. There is no place in God's kingdom for worry and fear. Any presence of it is an indicator that wealth is trying to be master. Think in your own life. 
I don't have a right to come in and tell you what to do, but think in your own life. How much are you worrying about your money? How much are you fearful about your circumstances? If fear is there, it's probably masquerading as frugality. You're patting yourself on the shoulder. You're saying, I'm being a good steward. You're saying, I'm saving and I'm doing what is right. If fear is present, God did not direct it. Wealth worship. These are his words. You just have to decide whether I hear from God or not. But these are his words. I even started to clean them up some. And I felt checked in him. He said, no, no, no. I gave you the exact wording I wanted. Wealth worship is hiding in money management. If you're a farmer, the farmer's statement, my barns are full. I need bigger barns. I need some place to store my wealth. Makes sense. But not in God's kingdom it doesn't. Because God never intended for his seed to be stored. He intended for it to be planted. Because where that came from, there's more coming. Fortune, wealth is the enemy of faith because of as I've already alluded to. With wealth, we become self-sufficient. We don't actually need God. I have actively developed in your presence the perception and the understanding that I and my family knows how to handle money. I'm not saying that my intent or our intent was wrong. We didn't want you feeling that we were a money-grubbing church. We didn't want you to be a church that felt pressure to give. But I'm going to tell you a part of the story that we forget. Because when dad got done building that metal building, we couldn't occupy because we'd run out of money. Now we always tell you the part about God's miraculous move where they waive fees and we got occupancy. But the reality is, is we ran out of money. But God didn't. We did. He didn't. We didn't know what we were doing. He did. We've never known what we're doing. If we have a vision that we are actually able, by our own ingenuity and our wisdom, are able to figure out how to fund it, then that vision is not from God because it's not a big enough vision. God has gone over and over and over again giving vision after vision that is always bigger than anything that any human can provide because God says, I need you to believe me. I need you to trust me. I need you to be reliant upon me. I need you to understand that you can't do it. It's not by might. It's not by power, it's by my spirit, saith the Lord of My intent was right, but I've been idolatrous. Thank God for the kindness and mercy of our Father that He has not just zapped me. The waves of repentance that have flowed over me in the last three days, all through the night, all through the day, as I realize how wrong I have been. I've taken consolation that he would not bring repentance to me if he did not have revival on the other side of it. I take consolation that the Lord's discipline is a sign of the Lord's love and delight. But I still have failed you. Some of you are stuck where you shouldn't be stuck. You're worried when you shouldn't be worried. 
Because I did not give you the example. God went on and said the only way to serve well, way not to serve wealth is to make that wealth bow and serve the only true God. As surely as God in the Ark of the Covenant was placed in the temple of Dagon and God compelled Dagon to his face and when they attempted to prop him up, he broke his head and his hands off, prostrate before the only true God. God's provision of $500,000 that was transmitted to us through the faithfulness of our elders has established itself in this church as an idol. We're afraid to lose it. It has become our security rather than the simple promise of our God. I am with you. These are still his words. The only way to stop serving an idol is to destroy it. You have to make it prostrate, bow, serve. It wants to be master, it must be slave. It wants to rule, it must serve. The only way to defeat greed, as I've taught you, is to give. And I now understand that the only way to turn God's provision from our idol of security back to his provision. Spend the money. Spend it on my kingdom. Spend it on what I tell you to do. Because I don't need to manage my money. I have so much wealth, so much resources. I don't have to manage it. It never runs out. I literally make money. I create it. And the image of the farmer is why he sent me there. That seed, if it goes into the ground, will produce more seed. It's a fact of life. It was set in motion at the creation and it has not broken yet. You put a corn of wheat into the ground, you leave it there for a period of time and it will bring forth much more corns or kernels of wheat. He spoke through the prophet Malachi and he said, if you bring, you put in my storehouse, Not your storehouse. My storehouse. You watch and see if I don't open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. And here's the key. A blessing you cannot contain. If we can contain it, we're in control. If we're in control, we feel secure. If we feel secure... We don't have faith. And if we don't have faith, we're not pleasing God. And Jesus said, you only got one of two choices. You're either serving God or you're serving wealth. There's no neutral ground. There's no, I'm not serving God, but I'm not serving wealth. No, no, no. You're either serving God or you're serving wealth. Those are your only two choices. Those are the defaults. And if you do not have faith, if you do not walk in faith, then you are not pleasing God. Let me give you an example. Pharaoh had enslaved the people of Israel, the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What were they building? Storehouses. These cities that you hear about, they were not for living. Literally, Pharaoh was so wealthy that he built cities that were nothing but grain storehouses. And he looked at these Jews, however many hundreds, if not millions of people, and he said, I need more bricks, I need more bricks, I need more bricks. Why? Because I need more storehouses, I need more control, 
I need more places for my well. The God of Israel appeared to Moses on the backside of the desert in a flaming bush that did not consume. He said, I've heard the cries of my people, my enslaved people. As Pharaoh demands more bricks, more bricks every day. No Sabbath, no day off, no rest, no peace. He said, I've heard the cries of them. And have come to set them free. What many of you may not know is that Pharaoh in Egyptian society was in fact himself considered a god. In fact, if the Nile River did not, I believe it was for three years successively flood, Pharaoh was expected by his people to literally sacrifice himself, kill himself, because they believed he was a god and he would come back in the form of his son. Imagine that kind of control. Imagine the hell he lived in. Imagine how neurotic he was. Imagine how much he walked, watched the river Nile. Imagine how much he sweated. Because Pharaoh knew he wasn't a god. Onto that stage he sent Moses. God says, go with a single message to Pharaoh. Let my people go. Go to what? I want to take them to a desert. They first get to the desert and they begin to complain to Moses. Moses, you brought us here to die. At least in Egypt, though we worked all day long. And we stood the chance of being squeezed in between those massive rocks in your city, in the cities of Pharaoh. At least we had leeks and onions. We've got nothing. It's desert. Where's our provision? The God who said, let my people go, fed his people bread that miraculously appeared on the desert floor each night. He told them, don't store it. What'd they do? Acted like the idolatrous people that we all are, and they stored it, and God destroyed it. They opened it up in the morning, it was full of worms. It was nasty and putrid. And he said, I told you, there's more where that came from. Yeah, but God, I, I, don't, I don't control where that came from. I don't know how that happens. I, what if you don't show up? That's why you have to believe me. They walked on shoes that did not wear out. They wore clothes that did not fray or disintegrate. This crazy God of Israel stepped into the most powerful nation in the world. And he took Pharaoh's head and with force he drug it down to the ground till Pharaoh who said you may not have my slaves begged and ordered and told the Egyptians take all of the gold, the brass, the silver and give it to these Hebrews and tell them go. How many times do I have to hear it? How many times do I have to read it? I and I alone am God. And beside me there is none other. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make things that are graven an image that you can control and see. For I the Lord am the only Savior. And beside me there is none. We know them. We quote them. We even shout on them. But I haven't been living it. I apologize to my family. I hope I haven't made life a living hell. Because when you serve another God... It will be your master. And it will demand more bricks. 
It'll wear you out day in and day out. You will be fearful. You will be full of anxiety. But when you serve God, He gives you peace that passeth all understanding. But you're going to have to believe Him. So what's Israel do? They meander through the desert. They get to Mount Sinai. Moses goes out to get more instructions about how to build the house of God. And Israel takes the wealth that God had provided for them to build his tabernacle. And they built something they could control. They built something they could see. They built the golden calf. Because God wasn't working on their timing. Because Moses wasn't showing back up when they thought he should. We got to do something. Egypt was pretty powerful, so I, I guess we'll build one of those. We'll build ourselves a calf. Not realizing that all that wealth that God had provided, God was going to ask for it again. He's going to ask for it back. He's going to say, bring it. Because they didn't know that once they got enough faith to cross the Jordan, they were going to walk into houses already built. They were going to walk into vineyards already planted. They were going to walk into fields already tilled. They were going to walk into houses already furnished. They were going to walk into cities already walled. They were going to walk into the provision of God that he'd already prepared for them from yet another source. But you can't ever see that source. He's not going to show it to you because if he shows it to you, then you don't have to have faith. You don't have to believe him. You don't have to rely on him. And without faith, you can't please God. So the message from God, the final word that he said to me is either you destroy that idol or I will. He's not angry with us. Any more than I'm angry with my children when I love them and I correct them. I don't like what's happening to them. I don't like what they're experiencing. I may get quite intense, but I love my children and he loves us. But his word to me, which of course is terrifying because the source of my security is a half a million dollars. And God says to me, you either spend it, which means I'm losing my security or I'm taking it, which means I lose my security. God don't play fair and he don't play nice. He's a king. Stay tuned for more lessons about that in a few. He's a king. He does not ask our permission. He does not really care about what we think. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm not trying to be nasty to you. But God is not interested. He has been very clear with me. I don't care what you think about this. This church is mine. Your father and your mother planted it and I used them. But never, never mistake that I used them to include them. I did not use them because I needed them. And when you came to me and you said, you cannot build buildings and I do not know how to manage money like my father. And I said to you, the way you do it is the same way your father did it. Give the missions and I'll handle the supply. I meant it and it's still true. I don't need your money. I don't need your expertise. I don't need anything from you. I've included you. I love you. You are my child, but I do not need anything. You need me. You must rely on me. You must have faith in me. You must listen to my vision and do what I tell you to do. And it will, by definition, be bigger than what you can do. It'll be bigger than the people around you can do. It'll be bigger than anything. But I, the Lord God, am the creator who spoke light into existence. I'm the one who created the firmaments and the stars in the sky. I'm the one who provides everything. You don't make breath. You don't make air. You don't make blood. I conceived you. I put breath in you and I determine when you die. You live, you breathe, you have your being inside of me. Have faith in me. So our idol has to bow And right now, the only thing I got 
spend it. I'm not spending it on Twinkies. If he told me to, I would. He hasn't told me to. He's told me to spend it on people. And it took me a whole night. I know the voice of Almighty God. And it took me a whole night to hear him say, the reason I gave you some of this money, the reason I blessed Newark with some of this money is so that you can reach out to your friend and you can bring him to a safe place and you can honor him the way he should be honored. You can give him a place to serve. And at a later date, I'll tell you whether you can keep him or not. And until then, go take care of your friend. It took me all night to hear the voice of Almighty God. That's the power of idolatry. That's the power of wealth that inserts itself as master and says, no, 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 no. Don't you risk my position. Don't you risk it. And what about us personally? Does God have a problem with your 401k? Does God have a problem with your car, your house, your land? No. Your father knows how to provide all your needs. He says it and he loves to do it. It's his pleasure to give you the kingdom. And I don't know how it applies in each of your lives. I know a spirit of God that will be able to tell you. But there is no way that this that had a hold of me didn't get a hold of some of you. There's no way And what has to break out is a spirit of generosity that goes beyond what is safe. I told you we have no debt. We got everything to cover the bills. I'm not here to take up an offering. Everybody listen to me. I'm not here to take up an offering. That's not the point. You can only worship God. Him alone can you worship. If you worry or fear about your money, it's got you. you say, well, I'm only human. I know. And humans are idolatrous. And God is jealous and he will not share his glory with any. If your money matters more than people, It's got you. If it takes you all night to hear the voice of God that says go and do something, it's got you. Now the good news is, is God is all up in this land of Egypt. God's all up in these pews. He's picking a fight with us and that's good news. Because the fight he's picking with us isn't with us. It's with the idolatry within us. He's not here to destroy us. He's here to save us. He's not here to condemn us. He's here to set us free. He's not here to hurt you. But he is going to touch your gods. He's going to touch your wealth. You either make it bow or he'll take it. You hear me? You either make it bow or he'll take it. Pastor, what does that mean to make it bow? I have no foggy idea. I'm having enough trouble trying to figure out what I'm supposed to do with my own finances and what I'm supposed to do in leading the church. Man, I'm over my head already. I got no idea what you're supposed to do with yours. I will never tell you what you're supposed to do with yours. But he will. Same God that talked to me on that general conference and gave me words of instruction that were for this body is the same God that can speak to you and tell you exactly what you need to do. He'll look at you when you walk in and tell him all the stuff you've done right. God's very unimpressed that we are number eight, I think it is, in per capita giving in global missions. He's very unimpressed that we're 36th in the nation. He doesn't care any about that. We could be much less and he'd be pleased with us. We could be much more and he'd be angry with us. And it all hinges on one thing. Are we worshiping another God? This morning... 
I'm here to kick off a revival. But it starts with repentance. No revival comes without us first calling what it is, bowing our head before God, putting ourselves down before him and saying, Father, forgive me and save me and set me free. So, annual business meeting? Yeah, you're going to see a bunch of money got spent. More than I ever thought I would ever bring to an annual biz meeting. <laughs> I don't know when he's going to stop it. I don't know how far he's going to take us down. Only he knows our hearts. But here's the faith. If he takes us down to zero, he's unequivocal. There's more where that came from. I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. I am with you. Just because you don't know what's in the promised land or just because you can't see what's in the promised land. I can. I know. I know what I have. Some of you need to reach out to God. And I'm closing. And ask him to give you an abandonment of joy. A freedom that's not tied to what you control or what you're able to handle. But that's tied in the excitement of a simple promise. I am with you. When you face things that are bigger than you, hear his voice. I am with you. When you don't know what to do, hear his voice. I am with you. When you're fearful, dispel that fear because he is with you. I have no foggy idea how to end this. I've never preached a sermon of repentance. I've never been this transparent. But I told God at 16, I would serve him the way he required. And I haven't erred yet. I've sinned. I've been broken. But when he finally gets my attention, I've never not done what he asked me to do. And all I know is he told me to get up here and tell you I'm sorry. And that I am actively tearing down our idol.
This altar is open. Would you come and pray? This altar is open. Would you come and pray? Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.
the Apostle Paul wrote, and he said that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And that those who run after it pierce themselves through. They pierce themselves. Not the enemy, not, not anyone else. They pierce themselves through. I believe that the Apostle Paul, again, is picking up on exactly what Jesus taught. You probably heard it directly from him. Money's not the problem. It's what you're loving. Because what you love is what you worship. Now, I don't want to take away from anything that God is specifically directing and, and working in your heart and your mind. And he'll, he'll continue to work in your heart and your mind. Don't, don't expect that he's fully spoken today. This has been percolating in me since February. So give God a few days and weeks to work in yours. And for those of you that have been around here, I, I, I knew coming into this service that at the very least, this is the time to once again examine our loaves and fishes. Now, there's a, a number of you that know what I'm referring to, but there's a number of you that don't. So allow me just three minutes. There was a little boy with five loaves and two fish. And he gave it to Jesus. Jesus took it, and we know what he did. He broke the bread, and he broke the fish, and he multiplied it to the extent that he fed my estimates based on women and children. It's probably twenty to 25,000 people, minimum. And when they were done, they had 12 baskets full of the leftovers left over. So I know that the little boy ate more than he would have with the five loaves and the two fish. Because I have five children, and I know how they eat. <laughs> Let me just tell you, in my mind, the five loaves and two fish was the equivalent of a, of a stick of string cheese and a couple crackers. It was just to tide him over. And a lot of Christians do that part well. You come in, God begins to work in your life, you begin to hear our teaching. And you begin to see in the Scripture, and the Spirit begins to speak to you about giving of your tithe. If you think God works in ways that make sense, I'm telling you, no math professor will ever tell you that 90 or 80 is more powerful than 100, ever. And yet it is. You'll take that step of faith. You'll give him your loaves and your fish. And how many here can wave your hand as testimony? that he's returned it many times over. But here's where the problem is. When he returns it many times over, that's where wealth tries to rear its head as the master. And the key is, is you take your 12 baskets left over and instead of just immediately deciding what you're going to do with them, you come back to the master. You had five loaves and two fish. Now you've got 12 baskets of bread and fish and you stand before the master and you say, you needed all of my loaves and fishes the first time. Do you need all of this back? Now my experience tells me that rarely does he ask for it all back. Allow me this indulgence. I can't prove this. But do you really think the hands that picked up a piece of bread... And as he broke it, multiplied it, do you really think he needed to pick up the other four? Why? He'd never ran out. Do you think the hands that picked up the fish and began to break it needed to pick up the other fish? No. My point is I don't think he, he rarely, in my experience, needs it all back. But he knows your heart. He knows what's happening, and he'll determine what amount will take the wealth out of master and put it in servant, and you give it back to him, and you know what will happen. He'll multiply it back to you, 
And then you come back to him with all those baskets. And you say, Master, what are you, what, what do you want of it? What, what is it that you need? And then you give him that. That's what I mean. Every time you ever hear me say it's time to go to God with our loaves and our fishes. It's time to sit back down and have a conversation with Jesus and say, you've been so good. Now what do you need of my loaves and my fish? If you'll follow that, at least that, and he may have particulars to you, but if you follow that at least, I promise you, wealth will continue to be subjugated to the one and only true God. Now, the exciting thing is, is you know what the God of Israel loves? Read the Old Testament. He loves parties. He doesn't just tell people, don't sleep with your neighbor's wife. He doesn't just say, I'm the only God and, I, and don't you worship any other gods. He also commands them to keep a number of feasts. Okay, let's translate that into our days. A number of parties. Multi-day parties. All day, all night parties. He even tells them to take money and save up for the parties and then blow it on the parties. So I think it's probably very appropriate from his vantage point that after this sermon and after this season of repentance and as his people are still in the place of trying to wrap their brains about where are we going, God, and what is it that I'm supposed to do, that we all go have a party that celebrates his provision for us, that celebrates a beautiful family that he's gifted us with for at least the next season of their life. All of us that he has provided us with relationships with. All of that great food that we're going to eat over there. All of that has come from him. For we came into this world with nothing and we will leave this world with nothing. So everything we have, it's from the Lord. And would the church say, Amen. Amen. That was the prayer of Thanksgiving. Go eat.